from the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Uh, certainly been a little frustrated with some of the dysfunctions here. It's, it's worse than I thought. Arizona's freshman lawmakers tell it like it is about their first full year in Congress. Plus, AZ merit scores show Arizona students aren't meeting the state standards. We'll hear what schools are doing to change that. And with the latest mass shooting, we'll take a look at the investigation and what Arizona is doing to prepare for mass emergencies. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News. I'm Jackie Fadia. And I'm Erica Lang. Thanks for joining us. Tonight we begin with an update on the San Bernardino shooting. Here's what we know so far. The FBI has taken the lead in the investigation. After a search of one of the suspect's home and garage, authorities found 12 pipe bomb type devices, plus hundreds of tools, many of which could be used to construct improvised explosive devices. They also found 2,000 9 millimeter rounds and over 2,000 rifle rounds. Investigators are still unclear what the motive was behind the attack. Terrorism is a possibility, but they have not ruled out this being workplace related. San Bernardino was the largest mass shooting in the U.S. since Sandy Hook in 2012. And agencies across the country know this type of violence can happen anywhere. Reporter Julia Thatcher looked at what different departments in Arizona are doing to prepare for mass emergencies. Mass shootings make headlines and flood news screens, but it also creates public awareness and causes for concern. It's going to happen, just a matter of where. In recent events, the public often wonders, how is my police department preparing for mass emergencies? What I found out was that it was more about what individuals and businesses can do to help prepare first responders. The majority of active shooter incidents occur by someone who is familiar with the property, possibly a coworker. So they're going to know those same elements that you do. We assume that our first responders have not only the skill set, but the knowledge. If they haven't been in your facility, they're not familiar. So the best thing you can do is bring them into your, your facility and have them take a look and evaluate it and say, here's where I see you have some vulnerabilities. Departments that I reached out to today declined to do an on-camera interview or even comment on how they prepare for mass emergencies. The reason being, they didn't want to divulge even the slightest part of their emergency action plans. The Phoenix Police Department did give a statement which said in part, we have had multiple training sessions specific to active shooter scenarios, which have included various community partners, police and fire officials. As we work to ensure the safety of our own local community, our hearts go out to the victims, families and first responders affected. Penzone said people need to be conscious, but he doesn't want them living in fear. You may find yourself caught in a situation that you are unprepared for and never expected. That doesn't mean if you're hurt that you're going to die. Continue to fight. Something that is usually overlooked is having a second uh, audible alarm separate from a fire alarm that can be used to signal other uh, emergencies such as an active shooter. Live in the control room, Julia Thatcher, Cronkite News. This week, Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio called on Arizona's 250,000 gun owners to be prepared to use their own weapons to fight terrorism and mass shooters. Cronkite News reporter Audrey Wheel talked with other law officers and safety trainers about citizens fighting back. In an active shooter situation, there are three options, run, hide, fight. And if you're going to fight, experts warn you need to know what you're doing. We want you to defend yourself. But you have to be cautious in doing that. Know the, know the laws, um, know what's entitled, what it, what it means to have a concealed weapon. If they're in a position where they don't have a choice but to defend themselves, where that choice to run or hide is not there for them anymore and they have to fight, then absolutely, yeah, draw your firearm and, and take action. This video from the Arizona Counterterrorism Information Center shows citizen options in an active shooter scene. And at Triple Nine Training, anyone is welcome to practice responding to the same types of situations. You're okay to use the gun, but you need to be very aware of not only what you're shooting at, but what's around it, um, what else is going on. The simulator prepares people for that, working like a video game with several different shooting scenarios. But even a well-trained civilian needs to be careful. You're not the police. Um, you're not somebody who's out there that is expected to take action for third parties. So in the majority of the situations, both us and law enforcement will usually tell people, unless it's a life or death that you have like no other choice, I want you to be a good witness, keep that weapon holstered. But he says the bottom line is you have to do whatever it takes to keep yourself safe. In Phoenix, Audrey Wheel, Cronkite News. 
gun control policy is not a new debate. The Carnegie Night News 21 project has that the Cronkite School did a full in-depth investigation into gun culture in America. For a full report, go to gunwars.news21.com. The Mexican Supreme Court recently ruled that individuals have the right to grow marijuana for personal use. Many see the ruling as opening the door to legalization. There are mixed emotions about the issue in Ciudad Juarez, a Mexican border city recovering from years of drug violence. High above the U.S.-Mexico border, agents search for illegal activity. That's the, the point where two countries and three states come together. On the ground... Others stand guard. Drug smuggling routes in this region cut right through Ciudad Juarez. And nowhere does the debate over legalizing marijuana in Mexico mean more. Drug trafficking will go down and there would be fewer people involved in violence. Raul Pada has experienced that violence firsthand. He was wounded at a high school birthday party that was attacked by gunmen five years ago. 16 people died, including fellow student athletes. There's mixed opinions on the legalization of marijuana in border cities like Juarez. Many people are still healing from years of violence. Many in this border city oppose legalizing marijuana. I don't think our young people and children are ready for legalizing any type of drug. Lupita Davila's son was one of the student athletes killed in the birthday party massacre. Her mission now? Help a generation of children who have survived this bloodshed. They were victims of years of extreme violence. Every folder on Lupita's table represents a child who needs psychological counseling. As Mexico debates legalizing marijuana, this border city is still coping with the consequences of the brutal drug trade. In Ciudad Juarez, Katie Miri, Cronkite News. The head of the DEA in the region bordering Juarez does not think legalizing marijuana will help reduce drug smuggling. The special agent in charge in El Paso says drug cartels will take advantage of any legalization effort on either side of the border. They're criminal organizations. They're in business to make money. Uh, and if something is legal, well, they will still try to sell that product. Marijuana remains an illegal cash crop in Mexico. At times, smugglers are bringing more meth and heroin across the border. The release of the AZ merit scores this week confirmed what we already knew, that Arizona students aren't meeting state and national education standards. Cronkite News education reporter Angie Schuster took a look at why this past year's low passing rate might actually be promising. The passing rates for English and math on the inaugural AZ merit test didn't exceed 42% for grades 3 through 11. And although these low scores show the majority of Arizona students aren't meeting the state standards, it gives us a place to start. I was really proud of, uh, proud of our school. And we went in knowing it was the first year, it was a, a baseline year. So whatever scores came out, great. That's just where we're going to start. Principal Michelle Ottstadt, like many others, prepared herself for her school scores in October. For parents, uh, and for everyone really, th these scores are, are a bit of a wake-up call. The spring 2015 test does reflect five years of work on alignment, and then at some point you just have to get a benchmark. Justin. Thank you, Justin. Taking a look at each grade level, the baseline at Copper Ridge School is above the state average. And Ottstadt started planning curriculum and changing the way the test will be administered to provide more instruction time for her students. We're already putting our plan together as to what the fa factors were um, to, to establish that baseline, and now we're moving forward to, um, to increase those scores for next year. Her school's plan includes getting students into a positive mindset working with her students on technology skills that many didn't have going into the new online test, like typing, and providing resources throughout the year so that students who may have scored as proficient or minimally proficient can learn the academic standards that they may have missed. We want to use this as a starting point. Uh, if you're a parent, you want to look at your student's results and say, where is my student uh, maybe struggling a little bit? What do they need a little extra support? And then work with the teacher, and, and that's something that teachers do uh, already. 
Most education leaders I talked with say the low scores on the 2015 AZ Merit will actually help our students. We now know where they are compared to the state standards and can change curriculum to help better meet their needs. In the Broadcast Center, Angie Schuster, Cronkite News. A decline of enrollment at Mesa Community College, Red Mountain location, has the administration fighting to keep this 15-year-old campus from closing. Cronkite News reporter Kendall Barley stopped by the campus to see what steps they plan to take to stay open. Full-time enrollment here at the Red Mountain campus has dropped nearly a third since the year 2011, so a new plan has been put in place to change that. Provost Patrick Burkhardt shared their plan with me. Administrators have set a goal to stabilize enrollment. They are rearranging classes and offering different options for students to have a flexible schedule and to make the location student and commuter friendly. The Red Mountain campus is a smaller environment than other community colleges, so it's just a little easier to get around and get classes. They are planning to increase the marketing budget and have added two recruiters for this location specifically. MCC has also reached out to high schools in the area to build a partnership and set an academic focus. They have a good reputation with um, a number of universities and the professors here are really educated in their field. Administrators from the school wouldn't speak to me on camera but did send me this statement, which reads in part, one of the faculty-driven efforts is to offer a new scheduling option at our Red Mountain campus that provides flexibility to help students fit college into work and family life. For this coming spring semester, enrollment is already slightly higher than last spring, but the administration says they still need to see higher enrollment before taking any further steps. In Mesa, I'm Kendall Bartley, Cronkite News. Arizona's two freshman lawmakers are talking with Cronkite News about their first year in the nation's capital. Representatives Martha McSally and Ruben Gallego say the challenges of Congress went beyond their expectations. Our Washington Bureau reporter Adriana Barajas joins us live from Capitol Hill. Adriana. It's been almost one year since Congressman Ruben Gallego and Congresswoman Martha McSally were sworn into office here at the U.S. Capitol. This week I sat down with them as they look back on their year. One Democrat, one Republican, but these two Arizona freshmen agree on something. The Congress can be a dysfunctional place. You know, I expected it to be uh, not easy. Um, it's, it's worse than I thought. For Phoenix Democrat Ruben Gallego and Tucson Republican Martha McSally, the impediments to get things done in Congress has been a challenge. Uh, certainly been a little frustrated with some of the dysfunctions here and um, the dynamics that actually I think are barriers inside the Beltway to actually fixing things that are impacting people outside the Beltway. And although both are frustrated with the current system, they are proud of what they've been able to accomplish. We've been able to get people, you know, VA benefits, Social Security benefits. We've been able to re reunite, you know, military members with their, uh, you know, their wives and their kids that were, you know, stuck overseas because of government bureaucracy. For McSally, getting four pieces of legislation passed through the House this year and one bill signed into law has been her greatest accomplishment. You know, given the realities, I've been looking for where we can find solutions that actually we can get across the finish line. Since both of them are former veterans, there have been areas of agreement on issues concerning the military. Uh, he was, I think, the only Democrat who supported keeping the A-10 flying. But what these two members have learned in their short time in Congress. Here what I've learned is that you actually have to get many people to join with you at one in one kind of set of ideas or an agenda and need to push at the same time. Despite the challenges, they must like something about being here. Both have filed for re-election in 2016. Live on Capitol Hill, Adriana Barajas, Cronkite News. Arizona has outlawed payday loans in the state, and that has some residents turning to auto title loans. Coming up on Cronkite News, how these loans impacted one valley man's life and cost him his vehicle. And one organization is using the outdoors to help wounded troops who were injured during combat. It's the time of year when many families need quick cash for the holidays. Payday lenders are no longer allowed in Arizona, but in many cases, auto title loans have taken their place. Sometimes a little extra cash can really brighten up your holiday season.
Need holiday cash? Come to Title Max now. The offers are enticing. I didn't have a whole lot of money at the time. I wanted to buy some Christmas presents, pay up some bills for my family. After shopping around, Scott Suitella, a U.S. Air Force veteran, thought he found a deal. And the gentleman that answered the phone asked me some questions about my vehicle and then uh, told me I can get you $2,000 for $150 a month. And I thought, well, wow, that was great. But that did not include the $300 a month in interest. We called Maximum Title Loans, but the company did not want to comment on the terms of this loan or any other. When Suitala, a father of two, could no longer make payments seven months later, Maximum Title sent someone to his home. Woke up the next morning to um, go to work and my car was gone. It's a story repeated across the country as the number of auto title loan companies grows. If you drive through some of the neighborhoods, we know it's like economic redlining. Um, we know they're looking at families that make right at or below $40,000 a year. State Representative Debbie McCune Davis wants more consumer protections. The Title Loan Association says there's a need for short-term loans. Uh, anything that limits that availability will simply force consumers to either go to offshore lenders, tribal lenders, uh, uh, unlicensed lenders, perhaps somebody in an alleyway. I see a, a similar vehicle every once in a while, everyone's, you know, in the, in the street, and I'm like, no, that's not mine. But he's not looking for another auto title loan. The money you would get from these people is not worth what's going to happen later. Scott now has another car, thanks to help from a family friend. The Arizona Department of Financial Institutions licenses auto title loan companies and takes complaints. The department says consumers should read their contracts carefully before signing and know before you owe. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton proclaimed today the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. We continue to fight to make our city better for everyone, but we have more work to do. At downtown Cityscape Ice Rink, Stanton recognized members of the Arizona Coyotes sled hockey team, winners of this year's USA Sled Classic. And the champions showed off their talents to the mayor and a cheering crowd. A program to provide wounded U.S. military men and women therapeutic outdoor adventures. Cronkite News reporter Sonny Scott traveled to Springerville and met an Army soldier who uses hunting to cope with his war injury. Adventures put on by Wounded Warrior Outdoors can take troops all over, from bear hunts in Canada, fishing expeditions in Florida, and even elk hunting right here in Arizona. The outdoors of the White Mountains of Eastern Arizona are calm and scenic, and especially peaceful for Sergeant Jose Valdenegro of the U.S. Army. For me, it's, it's actually a lot therapy-wise, because just being out in the open and away from everything, it's, uh, it's just beautiful to be out here. Valdenegro is one of many soldiers invited by Wounded Warrior Outdoors to go on his first elk hunt, a form of therapy for those injured in war. I was diagnosed with a PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. And for me, for a long time, I didn't really want to be, out, be outside or around crowds. So, uh, you know, being out here outdoors is kind of just being away from everything. Valdenegro lost his leg after an IED explosion while deployed to Iraq in 2009. He wears a special hiking leg to have better angle mobility while hunting in the forest. What it's made for is I can actually switch my feet out because I have different feet for different reasons. So if I have my running leg, I can put that on there and it switches out. According to the Congressional Research Service, more than 177,000 American troops have PTSD. Over 1,600 had major limb amputations between the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. The wounded warrior hunting trips get troops outdoors to work with the prosthetics and psychological disabilities. It gets me out and moving, you know. The only way to get better is actually push yourself and know your limits and to push your limits and, and see how far much power you can go. In Arizona, the wounded warrior program does an average of 20 hunts a year and pays for most of the hunting fees through donations. There's bigger challenges in the outdoors because you don't have elevators, you don't have escalators, you don't have ramps. We have to make do with what we've got out there and we got to work together as a team. Valdenegro is stationed at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, Texas, and receives therapy treatment at Brook Army Medical Center. He grew up in Tucson and comes from a military family. My, uh, my brother was deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan multiple times, and then pretty much everyone in my family has served in the military.
Wounded Warrior Outdoors' goal is to make a difference for troops, a way to thank them for their service. Put them in those positions and those situations, I think mentally and physically is very therapeutic for those servicemen and women who participate, but is also very therapeutic for those of us who are volunteers. For Valde Negro, hunting reminds him of the brotherhood bond he shared with his fellow soldiers. Being in the military is not as much people think it is. It's mostly about the guy to your left and right. You go there and you protect your friends. According to the Pentagon, more than half to two-thirds of U.S. troops wounded or killed in the Iraq and Afghanistan wars are victims of IED explosions. In Springerville, Sonny Scott, Cronkite News. Arizona's infant mortality rate is on the rise. Cronkite News reporter Jesse Schultz spoke with experts who say education could be the key to saving lives. In 2014, more than 800 children died in Arizona, up 4% from the previous year. The annual child fatality review named many factors as the cause of infant deaths in Maricopa County, but it found one of the most preventable causes was unsafe sleep environments. I was just did what I had to do to keep her asleep or happy, which was a lot of times just grabbing her, pulling her in bed. Mom of three, Danielle O'Connell, isn't alone. Co-sleeping is a common practice for some moms. As a society, it's we want to keep our baby safe. We don't ever envision that sleeping with our baby is going to kill our baby. Yomaira Diaz, an injury prevention specialist, is focusing her efforts on educating safe sleep for babies. Last year alone, 82 babies died in Maricopa County sleeping of asphyxiation, an increase from 2013. Really want to push not having them in the same bed with you. You may be tempted to fill your baby's crib with things like stuffed animals or pillows, but the Department of Health told me less is more when it comes to safe sleeping, and your baby's crib should actually look something like this. O'Connell co-slept with all of her kids. Oh, they're coming with me because that's where we're going to, that's how we're going to get everybody to sleep and be happy in my family. <laughs> but there are some other reasons for co-sleeping too. We have a lot of families that have a lot of people living together in one household, right? So now instead of having one bedroom for each kid, the entire family sleeping in one room. Healthcare providers are ready to re-educate the public about safe sleeping habits, including flyers, asking questions about home life, and media campaigns. We want every baby to live. O'Connell says educators need to concentrate on young and inexperienced moms, like she was. I would say that I don't, didn't really know any different. I really, um, I know that once my kids got in their own beds, I felt a relief. The study found that 94% of infant sleeping deaths were preventable. Along with more media campaigns, education, and questioning of home life, health care providers will also send lower-income families to programs around the valley, like Cribs for Kids, that provides cribs and other resources for families that otherwise can't afford it. Jesse Schultz, Cronkite News. The number of kids in Arizona's foster care system has skyrocketed in the last few years. More than 19,000 children are now in out-of-home care. Arizona Helping Hands is an organization when that they supports foster taken, families with cribs, how would I provide for them? clothing, schools. With me having limited income on my own. Danielle Brownlee currently looks after six children. Four of them are foster kids from relatives. Today, she is here to pick up a bed and a crib from Arizona Helping Hands for her three-month-old nephew. In Arizona, there are about 18,000 kids in the Department of Child Safety System. This graph shows how there has been an increase of children entering out-of-home care since 2011. There's no agency in the state of Arizona that supplies beds and cribs to children who are dropped on a doorstep of someone else to care for. So it's our objective to give those children a safe place to sleep at night. This program started two years ago, and they gave out seven beds the first month. In July of 2015, they provided almost 200 beds to children in foster care. I am picking up a twin mattress, a stroller possibly, and some two-year-old clothes. We are in the process of getting custody of my nephew. He's almost 18 months. Kind of happened out of nowhere. He was put into CPS custody. Like the many children who enter the foster care system and are in need of help, so do foster families who bring them into their home. What keeps me here are those kids. Hearing those stories, understanding that that child that otherwise might be sleeping in a car tonight is sleeping in one of our cribs in a safe place. Ivan Rodriguez, Cronkite News. Cronkite News is proud to be the news division of Arizona PBS. Here's what's next on Arizona Horizon and PBS NewsHour. Coming up after Cronkite News, it's Arizona Horizon. We'll hear about a research effort to enrich and deliver CO2 to help cultivate microalgae and bring down the price of algae-based biofuels.
I'm Gwen Eiffel on the next news hour. As the U.S. ramps up its fight against ISIS, we sit down with Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter. That's Thursday on the PBS News Hour. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.